This episode of the Fine Home Building Podcast is brought to you by Loctite Tight Foam. Say no to inefficient and drafty. Say yes to Loctite Tight Foam. When pros need to seal gaps too small for insulation, but big enough to create a draft, they reach for Loctite's Tight Foam. The high-density foam forms a tenacious bond to most common building materials, stays flexible to prevent cracking, and keeps air, moisture, and pests out of the house. Whether you're adding R value to the rec room or finishing a boring basement, give that space a second chance with Loctite Tight Foam. Visit LoctiteProducts.com for more information. Hey, podcast listeners, be sure to check out Fine Home Building's e-learning opportunities. We've created a special discount coupon just for you. Learn about sustainable home building, using mini split heat pumps, insulation, finished carpentry, and more. See all of what's available at courses.finehomebuilding.com and then use the special code PODCAST20 for a discount on any class. That's PODCAST20 in all caps. Thanks for listening. I'm just glad you got that on tape because that was the best explanation of uh, (laughs) deep energy retrofits and the whole bit that I've ever heard. I I love that you have your own in-house model and you're not hanging your hat on something that someone else made for a totally different purpose. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. I'm Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Fine Home Building Contributing Editor and TDS Custom Construction Production Manager, Ian Schwant. Hello, everybody. Our producer, Jeff Rose. Hi there. And our very special guest from Timber HP, Matt Amalia. Uh, Timber HP is a startup making wood fiber insulation in very rural Maine, uh, and we're going to talk to Matt about that and some other stuff. Uh, you can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Please email your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. Gentlemen, it's great to have you here. Thanks so much for being here this morning. Great to be here. I had the show, Matt, we were talking about uh, with the great anticipation we all had for the startup of your company, uh, Timber HP. Can you please tell us first off what Timber HP does and then maybe a little bit of the history of the company, if you would? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Well, thanks for having me on. I'm really excited to talk to you all. It's a great podcast and uh, you know, bringing a lot of important information to the building community. So Timber HP, as you said, is a startup. And it really is a startup. It's industrial scale manufacturing for sure. There's no doubt about it. But it really is from the essence of how we got it started and how we raised funds and how we got it uh, to the point where we are, we are in production now was a startup. It was myself. And my background is that I'm an architect and I've always focused on passive house buildings. And the other co-founder and CEO is Josh Henry, who is a Ph.D. chemist. Um, we were working together at a local not-for-profit and uh, a school we were doing a renovation uh, on the board and we started talking about how an architect and a chemist should collaborate and come up with new ideas and change buildings and building science and josh thought i was a lunatic for proposing it because he had no idea how an architect and a chemist would actually collaborate Um, but the more we had that conversation the more we actually realized there's a lot of intersections around his experience in material science and the challenges we face with building the next generation of sustainable buildings, you know, from biogenic sources, renewable buildings, healthy buildings. And that's where we converged. And one day, um, as the story goes, we were in the conference room, the room that I'm in right now, and we had a kind of sample piece of Gutex, I believe it was. This is 2015. And he kind of looked at it and said, well, what is that? And I was like, well, this is wood fiber insulation. It's an amazing material. It's made in Europe exclusively as a 20-year background. Um, it's not produced domestically. It's perfect for above grade wood construction. And like, particularly when we were were looking at the board product, and I said, this board product is for exterior continuous insulation. You install it on the exterior face of the sheathing to provide a continuous layer of insulation. And the great thing, the differentiator about it is it's like Gore-Tex. It's windproof, it's waterproof, but it's vapor permeable. It allows that building to breathe, which is a big differentiator, obviously, from foam. And so he's like, as a material chemist, he's like, well, this seems pretty straightforward. Um, He took it up to University of Maine Advanced Structures and Composites Lab, where he had been teaching and doing a lot of work. And they kind of reverse engineered it it just to see if there's a technical barrier to how 
it might be produced domestically, realizes that it was a very straightforward process, very similar to a lot of the composite, wood composites manufacturing, MDF, HDF, that sort of thing. And then the next question was, there must be a financial reason why it hasn't happened. And so we actually had the good fortune of connecting with some of the, one of the manufacturers in Europe and uh, talked to them. And a little, little bit of a tidbit about my background and Josh's, we both speak German. I actually have a degree from a German university. And so we had the advantage of being able to speak German and kind of interact with them on that level. And we went over there and just trying to inform ourselves. And I don't think we were the most threatening pair ever to, to, to go over to visit an industrial <laughs> site and an architect and a chemist who had no idea what they were doing. But he, he was interested in the story and he was interested in, in actually the state of Maine, where, which is where we're located and kind of the wood products history there. And he, he actually handed over his pro forma, like, so we could sort of update um, the European model with American inputs. And we realized something very important at that point. One was, uh, in Europe, wood fiber insulation is a bit of a sustainability premium product. Uh, it comes above the market in terms of cost. But what we realized when we slotted that pro forma into the Amer North American market, because of the low cost of our wood here, it would be cost competitive with the standard insulations on uh, across the market, foam, fiberglass, mineral oil. And so once we realized there wasn't a techn technological hurdle and it would be cost competitive and scalable as an alternative sustainable solution that's performance competitive uh, with these sustainability benefits, we realize, you know what, though we are not prepared to do a large industrial project, this needs to be done. And we just jumped right in and, and started off trying to, to build this project out. And here we are, gosh, I think six, seven, eight years later, um, we're in production and in the market with our loose fill product. And we're just firing up our bat line and our board will be out in the market uh, early next year. So we're making great headway. We're really proud of the accomplishments of our team. I have so many questions, man. But for starters, <laughs> I'm, th I'm sure that folks are wondering, where did you all get the money to start manufacturing insulation in a rural area? Well, that's a great question. You know, I, that was a big learning curve because when Josh and I first kind of identified the opportunity of this, we did not think that we were the ones to do it. We said, you know, let's present it to some of the big players, the composite manufacturers, the insulation manufacturers. Let's present it to them. We'll show them the model. Because for me, it was about just getting the product, in, you know, available domestically. You know, I had no interest in running a manufacturing facility. But what we realized is a lot of the big corporate players, they don't take that kind of risk on. Risk on. They really don't. That's not, that's not their model. They will buy us up later, I'm sure. But they will not go and say, hey, we'll put a bunch of money and see if this works in the market because there's a reputational question there that they don't want to confront. And so we had nothing to lose. We just had a lot of money to raise. But actually how we did it, the first move we made was reducing the actual capital cost of the project. And what I mean by that is uh, the, the manufacturer in Germany who gave us their pro forma, they ended up selling us their factory. So we were able to buy particularly the board line, which is a beautiful piece of equipment, uh, continuous press. Uh, we bought that for just north of $2 million. We moved it out of Europe and sent it to Maine for about $4 million. The value of that equipment alone is something in the 30 to $40 million range. When we came back home with that equipment, um, we were then able to buy uh, a paper mill. Uh, the UPM mill in Madison, Maine, which is where we're in production, was a beautiful mill built in the 80s. Um, and it closed down in 2015, 2016. It, by the way, was one of six paper mills that closed that year in Maine. And that had a net negative impact on our economy of $1.6 billion annually alone. So, you know, just devastating impacts of the loss of paper manufacturing in Maine. But the benefit was this beautiful resource, this asset, we were able to buy that for just north of $2 million. So basically, we were, we were able to save just about, in total, when you put all those pieces together, about $100 million. So first of all, you take a very expensive plant and reduce the cost of that through kind of going on a yard sale mentality and getting what you can and putting it together. So that was our first move. The second move was then you start with the friends and family seed round. You ask everybody, you check the you know the sofa cushion, cushions for coins and whatever money you can find. And then we went from there. And then we went to well-aligned people. We went to the lumber industry. We went to the loggers. And typically in Maine, you know, and a lot of these folks, that they're not always on the same page with each other. But they really realized that this was kind of a next generation replacement for paper and a great utilization and value add for the, the res wood residuals, which is our feedstock. And they actually came together and were, were extremely supportive of us. 
um, as we started to build the financial case and the model and, and the financing for the project. So we went from there. We had very good fortune of having some family offices support us um, to the point where we had a very nice equity stack. The rest of the money for the project actually came from a tax-exempt recycling bond from Citibank. So we were able to put enough equity together to leverage that bond for $86 million. And the nice thing about that was the it, what it saw was the our feedstock, the wood chips, the residuals, the byproduct of the lumber industry is considered an industrial waste stream. And they have incentives for projects that utilize those at scale. And that's how we were able to secure that bond. So that's, you know, that's essentially how we put the capital together for the project. First to reduce the capital, but then to be really scrappy. I mean, if anything, we're a grassroots startup. Uh, industrial startup. I think that's the way I characterize this because we've talked to everybody. I think we have 110 <laughs> investors in in our books just to get it, you know, to get it off the ground. It looks like you have a question, Ian. I hope you do. Yeah. Uh, can you speak directly to the builders out there who have no idea what you're talking about at this point with wood fiber, whether it's the infill or the bats or the board? I think uh, a lot of people hear exterior wood fiber insulation and they get bad memories of ripping off uh, poorly made wood sheathing that's all rotted. Can you talk a little bit about what the difference is between your product and some of those that people might be thinking about right now? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. Yeah, so the wood fiber insulation, it, it's three products. Um, and that's why we got excited about it, because it kind of fits in every aspect of the, of the building above grade. The first is the loose fill. So that's going to be a drop-in replacement for cellulose. Um, it's, it's a great product. It, it goes in with a blower. So basically, typically subcontractor installed. The fiber has really good integrity. Um, it's treated <laughs> excuse me, it's treated with boric acid, which gives it a class A uh, flame spread, which means it can be used in a whole variety of projects. Um, it has good, the fiber has good integrity, so um, very little settling uh, with really good coverage. That's the first product. And that's just basically the wood chips refined into that blown in fiber. The second product is a bat product, which we're actually going to use the same fiber stream as the blown in with a, a small amount of boric acid as a fire retardant. And we're actually going to put that into an oven with a, essentially a dry resin. We call it a bicomponent fiber. It's essentially um, a, a polyester strand, which gets mixed in about 4% by weight. So not very much, but it gives it that kind of squishy quality of a, a press fit bat. The material quality of this is very similar to like a Roxel bat. You know, it's not the roll up uh, pink stuff. It's, definitely got more integrity, which means that acoustically it performs extremely well and thermally it's going to be an R4 per inch. So also going to perform really well. The handleability, when you handle it, you cut it, the byproduct is sawdust. It's not the itchy scratchy stuff that most people associate with a lot of these insulation products. Um, and it's press fit. So it really fits snugly. Great for avoiding wind washing in the cavity, you know, just a really, really nice handling bat. The, you know, where it, where it differentiates itself is it doesn't comp compress well, like, like a mineral wool bat. So that means that when it comes, uh, you know, shipped to the job site, the bundles are rather large, you know, and they're basically in four foot sheets that get installed. So similar to that in terms of the installation. The third product is the board product. That's the one that was interesting to me. Um, we were using a lot of continuous ex in insulation. We were using, you know, foam, and then we went to a mineral wool. Um, and we really wanted something that was vapor permeable, but we also wanted something that had good density. So like when you're installing strapping or furring over that insulation system, it didn't get all wavy and, and uh, was difficult to install, but something that was really quite firm. And that's what the board is. Um, the board is essentially um, the refined fiber. It's put through a continuous press. So as I said before, it's very similar to like an MDF press. So MDF is medium density fiber, fiber board. We're low density fiber board. So instead of having that sort of hard density, which doesn't have an R value, we're going to de-densify that wood. And we're also going to mix in um, a wax coating, a paraffin, which will give it this water resistance in terms of bulk moisture. Handleability, you cut it with a circular saw. The byproduct is sawdust. It's very durable, um, both in terms of its handling but in, in and its installation, but also in terms of moisture and, and water. Because uh, obviously, we're going to be installing it on the outside of the building. It has to be durable. And... Uh, 
particularly up to two or three months, just like, for example, an Advantech is, and it has that same sort of treatment and, and rating as that. So good to be exposed to the exterior before the siding goes on with no concerns. Um, and then from an R value standpoint, it's about R3.8 per inch. So it's, it's competitive with open cell foams. And it has, as I said before, that really nice breathability, that vapor permeable with a perm rating of 30. So, you know, it's really sort of a very open in that exterior location, which is exactly what you want it to be in North to, you know, to breathe out that moisture. So the, the next question I'd have would be directly to other passive house architects and designers. Where do you put your exterior WRB layer in relation to this product? That's a great question. And, you know, we've seen several different approaches to how that can be done. For example, the Huber zip system, you know, that would be on the obviously on the OSB layer, and we would be installing it to that. What we're doing with our board is on the installation phase, we're putting a dimpled sort of surface to act as a drainage plane, so we're not going to trap moisture in that location. Um, there's other applications where you can install the WRB on the outside face of the wood fiber insulation. For the projects that I do, um, that's typically where we install it. It's easy to flash. It's easy to you know manage bulk moisture with that. So there, we have uh, at Timber HP an entire installation detail manual uh, that we've been working with Joe Stebrook on that, and we're really excited about kind of the level of detail that we're we're going to be able to propose to the industry. So. Um, that there's clarity on how that product should be installed. Well, we're going to talk more about Timber HP and your other businesses uh, in the after show. It's uh, a fascinating subject. I, I look forward to learning more about it. And it delights me that you've thought about the installer uh, ahead of launching the products, which makes a lot of sense. If someone doesn't know how to install something, their chance of success seems much lower in my estimation. Yeah, you know, I think that's a great point. And the way we've gone to market, our entire approach is, you know, we really want to be a, um, a, a solutions provider. I mean, we're, of course, an insulation provider, but we really want to be a building science solutions provider as we do that. Because what, I, what I'm seeing, you know, not coming from the architect side and kind of design build background is there's a lot of code changes. There's a lot of new requirements around air sealing. Um, <clears throat> we're making tighter buildings, more highly insulated buildings. And we all know that creates liabilities with moisture management. And it's how you do the bill, how you actually create that envelope, just like the question you were asking about, you know, where the WRB is and how that interacts and how drying occurs and bulk mo moisture management occurs. And I think for us, you know, particularly accrediting uh, Scott Dion, who is our chief marketing officer, he really saw the opportunity with this product to actually go out into the industry and say, this is how we can actually address code changes continuous insulation, moisture management, air sealing, blower door testing in a complete sort of envelope solution. So, so excuse me, solution. And that's, that's one of the benefit of Timber HP is we have those three products. We can, we're in the cavity, we're in the attic, blown in, and we're continuous exterior. And that differentiates us. So that actually allows us a great opportunity to provide solutions that work together uh, that manage moisture together, that manage the thermal envelope and thermal bridging together as a complete suite of above grade products. So I, I think it was what we saw, like, it's not where we started for sure, but with Scott's kind of guidance and vision, it really was where we realized the opportunity was for the industry is to be a solutions provider. Yeah, I look forward to hearing in the after show how you're going about distributing this product. I think that's going to be a, a really interesting end of the business model you've got. Absolutely. You know, we've been very fortunate um, to have some have made some strong, good relationships. And what's interesting about the products, as you can imagine, is the loose fill is going to be uh, mostly a one step distribution because you're selling direct to subcontractors, whereas the board and the bat are going to be one and two step depend and also depending on you know systems builders as well so it really is an interesting sort of opportunity and that's a an area that i was very unfamiliar with on the architectural you know construction and i was just a consumer but it, it turns out it's a very com <laughs> very complicated oh, yeah. industry and uh, i think uh, our team has done a great job sort of addressing how we fit into that well it is a delight to have you here matt thanks for doing this very much our uh, first feedback comes from Peter. And Matt, if you haven't heard the podcast before, Peter is, I would describe as uh, typical of our very uh, 
motivated, ambitious uh, DIY audience and uh, industrious. One might industrious even, say. even yeah. <laughs> Um, Peter writes, hello, FHB podcast. I just pulled into the driveway here at my house after checking out some rigid insulation options on a rainy day. Now, this is the kind of person that listens to this show. Um, (laughs) While listening to the FHB podcast and the Maps app showed me that I have a new street view image of our Boston area 1951 Cape style house. When I pulled in, I thought you would all find it amusing what I saw. The image captured the Monopoured ICF Foundation, which is insanely DIY friendly, in my humble opinion, if you have a well-fed, experienced help for the poor and the concrete free slab base material before framing. I started a month ago, and I'm a video editor by profession, but a DIY, uh, I do a DIY building project every so often. This one is the nuttiest one yet. Massachusetts has a new stretch code uh, adopted by some towns for certain size projects that our original 2,100 square foot plan triggered. Uh, Apparently additions larger than 1,000 square foot were the trigger in this case. That required a HERS 52 score combining the new and existing structure. Imagine solving that if you weren't planning to touch the existing structure of our old housing stock. So, So we scaled the project back to 985 square foot to not trigger the code but we decided to still retrofit and electrify the house, shoot for the HERS 52 score, and keep all the other aspects of a pretty good house. We were also trying to get the ACH 10.75 down to something more like one. The HERS requirement needed a four, but why stop there, right? Uh, I was I was also trying to repent for my previous building sins, and most importantly, trying to build a healthier and more comfortable house for my family. Thanks for everything you put out there, and for all the building de- details I'm using. Literally, I couldn't do it without y'all. Um, so I suppose since I'm sending this email, I might as well include the design build plans I made and some progress picks too. Maybe this is interesting to someone else out there. Thanks very much. Uh, what do you guys think? Uh, what about Peter's project? It's incredible, right? Yeah, I thought it was a really interesting project, and he had a good breakdown of uh, how that stretch code affects different buildings when you go to add on to them, and that can be pretty challenging. Matt, have you heard about this? Yes, I have. You know, we've been working with it a bit, and I think that's just kind of kind of the, the point in general. You know, buildings have become a lot more complicated. You know, we used to be able to just go in and kind of do whatever standard was required, and oversight was spotty in, in some cases. But now it really takes a very focused approach. And I think being able to to meet a lot of these performance targets and do it cost competitively, make sure that these buildings are viable and scalable and, you know, realistic in the market, given, you know, what people's incomes are and what it takes to build something. And that's why I feel like the more we can kind of engage with how collectively we get the information out there so that these challenges can be overcome and the resulting building is healthy and performs well. I love his comment about, you know, why stop at a an ACH that's okay and, you know, just take it all the way down and just that kind of mentality of going beyond code as well. So code can be onerous in some cases, but in some cases there's like, if you're going to do step one, you might as well take it all the way. So a really, really awesome uh, perspective in my view that he's sharing. I love seeing the photos. I think he took a great series of photos to document the process. And I hope you all check out the podcast page to look at, um, Peter's photos of his uh, edition, which is quite well done, I must say. This comes from Ed. Dear Patrick and Fine Home Building Podcast crew, as you discuss problems with homes or rental properties and the importance of having knowledgeable home inspections, I thought of this summary chart and the companion article in the October-November issue of Family Handyman uh, from Ed, a loyal podcast listener and all-access member. Well, thanks for being an all-access member, Ed, and thanks for the email. Did you guys see this chart of uh, – so uh, to paraphrase, it's a chart of likely problems associated with homes based on their vintage. So uh, it describes asbestos, lead paint. Uh, what are some of the other things in there, Ian, that caught your eye? Uh, it was actually, I think, was it transite duct work and plumbing vents? What is that even? Do you know? <laughs> I'll let Matt explain it from the architect uh, perspective. <laughs> Have you heard of this, Matt? <laughs> I did. I thought I, that was fascinating. And the and I think the evolution 
of knowledge, you know, kind of like it's not static what we're talking about here. And we think we solve problems and then we realize that there's there's issues. And I think that's such a, an important awareness to have. It's, it's, it's kind of the question of constant vigilance, always asking, is this appropriate? Do these materials work? What are we going to learn later? And I think that was a lot of what jump, you know, jump started our project was I know it, I know it's deemed safe. A lot of these materials we're using, but Quite honestly, that's not the feedback I'm getting from the guys and the gals installing in the field. And so what can be done better? And it's, again, it's kind of going be, like the question of going beyond code, kind of going beyond the baseline to make sure we're doing the best we can. Because these are long lived buildings. They last a long time. They're expensive to replace. So put the best materials in and be as thoughtful about it as you can. It's kind of my takeaway. I was taken by the uh, sheer number of things that can be a problem in your house based on its vintage. It must have been a list of, I don't know, two or three dozen things. And uh, it ranged from, you know, aluminum wiring to uh, problematic um, coatings and, yeah, sidings, horrible I think, stuff. I think radon was on the list as well about an emerging, you know, problem that wasn't dealt with early on and it has be we become aware of. And that, that one caught my eye. And uh, especially since we're building houses tighter, I got to believe it's more of a health concern uh, if you're having fewer air changes uh, versus, you know, old leaky homes where, you know, it might have just blown through with some, uh, you know, natural uh, convection or what have you. Absolutely. I will put that up on the podcast page for all of you who are curious, uh, especially if you're considering a home purchase in the near future. I would take a look at that list so you know what to look for based on the vintage of the homes you're looking at. Um, this comes from uh, a podcast listener who wished to remain nameless. He found our recent discussion of LED lighting, uh, quite interesting. And, uh, uh, I think it was six. 29, uh, 23 gauge ethernet cables were described as a way to provide, uh, juice to led lighting. And uh, this gentleman writes, 23-gauge uh, Ethernet cables and connectors are not sufficient for the amps needed for most LED light fixtures. We should always be following the manufacturer's instructions, which is the default NEC requirement. That's the National Electric Code for those of you who are unfamiliar. Matt, have you been putting LED lights in your projects? And how the heck do you know what to spec and how to tell people to install them? Because I think you'd agree this technology is still very much in its infancy. You know, I think for me, from the architectural side, merging with kind of the energy side, I absolutely have been in love with the LED technology that's emerged because you can do so many interesting things. Uh, you know, we've had some issues, as particularly early on with transformers and, and sort of getting the efficiency of the install, um, particularly kind of knowledge of uh, the electricians doing that install. There's a lot of learning going on there. And, you know, like any technology, there's some, there's some successes and there's also some issues that we came, you know, we came across. But when you just think of the efficiency jump of the lighting itself, you know, from an energy standpoint, it's, it is definitely an, an amazing sort of step forward and not to mention the longevity of those bulbs. So the replacement and then thinking about where they're located, knowing that the uh, replacement um, frequency is so low you, you from an architectural standpoint i think it just gets tremendously exciting um i i think the technology is going to continue to evolve and i'm and i think that's just such a key piece of making our buildings more efficient and you know from an energy standpoint more sustainable particularly as we're going to all electric uh on-site renewable approaches dropping and knocking that load back as far as we can is just critical first step so leds i think fundamental to kind of the future as we move forward Ian, how have the LED installations been going on your uh, remodeling and new home projects at TDS? Uh, typically done by the electricians, and depending on the electrical contractor for it, will you know, inform how well the install goes or how uh, far into LED lighting we can go on a project that maybe has some uh, kitchen cabinet lighting options or uh, we've had uh, a lot of closets now have the where you open the door and there's an LED strip above the door that lights up the closet and then it shuts off when you close the closet door. Uh, I think they're great products, but as we've talked about in the past, they're you're somewhat limited by your availability of knowledgeable installers. I've been observing how big the uh, transformers are. Uh, wh where the heck do you guys hide these things? 
Well, with <laughs> cabinets, a lot of times we end up putting them underneath the cabinet, and then you have uh, an access panel in the toe kick so that you can get to it later on. Mm, that's smart. I think that's such a that's such a great question. That's a struggle we've been having, and good thought from Ian. That's exactly the kind of approach we've been taking. One of the one of the um, interesting systems we've been using is actually a, a LED for downlighting that's installed in sheetrock and it has like a clip flange and a pigtail. And what I love about that is you can fit it in literally the layer of sheetrock plus strapping. So it can be in all sorts of applications and locations without having to hog out for, you know, framing or any of that to get a layout. And then the transformer, you know, to your point is, you know, is typically problematic, but the size of the hole, I think it's like a four inch diameter hole. Actually, the transformer fits in there. So that gets wired in the hole, just sitting in the sheetrock. And then there's a little pigtail that hooks on from that transformer to this really shallow little light fixture with little uh, sheetrock clips. It just snaps right into the sheetrock. Absolutely love that system because all the pieces that we've been struggling with, scale, transformer, location, it all just fits into that and it's a great retrofit solution as well so easy to set a grid layout there's no conflict with structure and then the, the transformers has just kind of become so simplified with how that thing pigtails into it so just a neat technology do you get any pushback matt from your uh, electrical contractors on using this stuff do they are they sold on it yet great question you know i think a lot of the folks that we've been working with we've been working with over a long period. So we've kind of grown together. And, and actually these fixtures came from one of our electricians. It was a, it's a really kind of happy <laughs> mm-hmm. discovery that they shared with us and said, look, we really like these for this application. Why don't you, why don't you look at it? And we just fell in love with that technology. So I actually see, you know, I actually like to rely on the subcontractors too, for their experience, because sometimes they've, they've already cracked the nut that, you know, we're struggling with. Ian, have you had any problems with uh, reliability with these new LED uh, generation of fixtures? Not in the last uh, 12 to 16 months, but I can remember a lot of instances two years and and plus ago where it seemed like if you had a 10-pack of them, you'd have at least one dud in the 10-pack, uh, but that seems to have been sorted out. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask Matt about these fixtures is have you had any experience with the gasketed ones for any airtight uh, drywall assemblies? Interesting. We have not. We, we, from our detailing, we tend not to use the, the, um, the drywall as our air barrier. So we, just because of the complexity around that. So we, we just try to avoid that altogether, to be honest. Don't in terms air, of, in, uh, airtight drywall approach generally, Matt, is your recommendation or is it just a, a, a case-by-case basis? You know, so for us, <clears throat> well, there's new construction and, and existing, you know, renovation. So I don't mean to, <laughs> yeah. I don't mean to claim that it's all the same because I think we in the, you know, on this podcast, we all know there's so much complexity that comes about just that simple question. But on new construction, we tend to use from the sheathing standpoint, the OSB layer as our air sealing layer and we're always assuming continuous exterior insulation on the exterior to protect that from any you know dew point issues so for us it's that's usually where we like to handle it because then we can tie it into the window system Um, we can tie it down to the foundation up into the sort of uh, attic insulation you know depending on how we're doing that in some cases though we have um, on a roof assembly gone to that uh, air sealing layer in that location what we'll tend to do is try and put an air barrier strap and then the sheetrock just again just to avoid those penetrations we do we do consider painted sheetrock though as a moisture retarder into that wall assembly you know it's it's it plays a role in our system for sure but it's not um it's typically not our air barrier per se well, our first question comes from Evan. Hello, fine home building team. A client of mine has a 2020 slab on grade metal shop building that is a, has moisture coming in around the perimeter. It looks like the slab flashing, if that's what it's called, is sloped toward the building and directing water inside as it flows down the exterior wall. I think the walls are sheet metal with metal framing and fiberglass baths, which are not conducive to mold growth, which is the client's concern. But her air samples did come back with elevated levels of mold. To rectify the source moisture issue, I thought about sealing around the outside perimeter of the exterior wall, 
but that kind of seems like a bad idea since water would have nowhere to go but into the building. Am I thinking about this the wrong way? Do metal buildings require a drainage blade slash weep area at the bottom of the wall, or they can, can they be caulked on the exterior? Thanks for the help. Evan Bachwig, uh, all, all Mold Pro Mold Assessment Consultant in Dallas, Texas. We hear from uh, Evan all the time. Thanks, Evan, for your uh, regular correspondence. Uh, thoughts, gents? Well, I think those buildings are difficult to waterproof to start. Uh, typically, that piece of flashing he's talking about is L-shaped and runs up behind the bottom uh, corrugated metal sheathing or corrugated metal siding. So it, it shouldn't be getting in behind that. It looked from the photos like possibly the grade was too high around the building and was allowing it to uh, actually flood in underneath that piece of flashing. Yeah, that was my that was exactly my instinct as well. It just was a bulk moisture kind of site site grading issue that if they could get some positive drainage away that that might start to mitigate some of those issues of that moisture migration under that layer. I think in this kind of commercial building, uh, you know, one of the ways to economize is to do less site work. And if you don't have to bring in dozens yep. of yards of gravel in and you can put the slab right on grade, uh, that's going to save a ton of money. But I think the risk is the building is too low. And yep. how do you guys propose solving the uh, observation that you've both co uh, come to is that this building is getting wet from grade? Well, one thing you could do is go with some Mike Gurton style ground gutters surrounding the building where you would have your your gravel channel with, I think Mike sometimes uses uh, EPDM roofing material in the ground to channel the water uh, away from the building. Yeah. You could look at something like that. The benefit of having the slab is if you uh, dug down the perimeter of the building, you'd actually have something to attach that ground gutter to, as opposed to a building that doesn't have the slab, uh, like my metal building just has the gravel floor. So I wouldn't be able to do something like that, but I do have the many yards of gravel surrounding the building. Yeah, Thoughts on this, guess, Matt? Yeah, I, I like that concept, because where, where my mind went initially was trying to get some sort of perimeter drain and I love the idea of the ground gutter and combining that. The question there is going to be, do you have a, a, enough site uh, slope for a positive outfall so you can actually move that water away? So I think there's, I like the idea of the ground gutter. And then if you have the opportunity to get some, uh, with some slope on that site to be able to get to, to daylight that, um, I think you're going to be able to move a lot more, a lot of the moisture away from the building. Jeff, you have thoughts on this. You always have a practical take on our builders' problems. I, well, I think that you guys are on the right track. I can't think of anything. You know, I'm. I do wonder how much you know of that is like splash from the roof, possibly. You know, and, so real gutters on the on well, the, on I, the I, or just having having that land in gravel rather than on dirt or asphalt or whatever it's hitting now. Yeah, he has the benefit of not being in a snow climate like I have where I can't physically put gutters on my metal building because the snow sliding off the roof would rip just about every gutter right off the building. So I, I had no choice but to have the gravel path around the building. But if you're in Texas, you could put regular gutters on it as well. That's an interesting question here. So, uh, you know... Uh, where gutters are a problem, uh, I'm guessing rural Maine is among those places. Am I right, Matt? <laughs> What's your go-to strategy for uh, roof water management? You know, we we do use gutters for sure. Um, you know, it's seasonally you have to, you can have issues with those. Um, overhangs obviously are, are another way just to get that moisture kind of like in this case to get that as far from the building as you can positive drainage appropriate materials as well at the drip line um, so you can avoid splashing to the extent that you can and, and also move that moisture away but in a lot of cases we do use gutters and you know try and be thoughtful about how we manage that runoff away from the building and, and sort of integrate it into the total concept so it just doesn't look like an added afterthought um, but you know, I tell you what, if there's one thing that we just will change the approach on just about every time is how we, <laughs> how we go about solving this problem, you know, cause I, I feel like each, each project has its own challenges to be honest. 
And you pointed out that site conditions have a huge uh, impact on how you deal with roof water too, right? Exactly. And there's other conditions around where, you know, you have havel space or patio space and, you know, where you take the water down, how you take the down, that down and manage it away from the building um, so you don't cause other, other problems on site. And a lot of times it really comes down to like form making roof lines, you know, where, where are you combining your valley, where are your valleys combining? What is the opportunity for good drainage? And then like in Maine, you get, you have the potential for serious ice dams, particularly if you create these sort of narrow conditions in these valleys. And then it doesn't matter if you have gutters or anything else, you're going to have, you're going to start to sort of um, create broader problems just by how you design the roof in the first place. So I guess to answer the, the question is I, our, our first approach is like, don't create huge problems. Be very thoughtful about how that roof is configured in the first place and avoid the valleys and the, and the dams and, and these sort of narrow uh, sort of conditions between buildings where no matter what, you're going to get splashing and, and you know, kind of build up ice and ice dam issues. So it really is, I think, kind of always keeping an upper level approach to that because the moment you've created a, a sort of a, a really tight valley, there's no good solution in my book <laughs> that's going to work. You're you're going to have to you're going to have to own that problem. And you know, unfortunately, like in all buildings, we 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 learn from mistakes, right? We learn from the things that didn't work. And you know, there's been a few areas where we we won't repeat some of the designs that we've made in the past. What do you think about Matt when you see uh, suburban McMansions with their wacky roofs? Uh, does that give you uh, anxiety? <laughs> kind of read my mind you know i <laughs> quite honestly quite honestly a lot of times i just don't understand i just don't understand the driver for it you know i think there's a there's a lot of um solutions that i'll look at and i'm just like i'm not sure why they did that you know i know there's going to be some problems resulting and there's other you know there's other like logic which created those situations so i just look at them and say i quite honestly don't understand what's you know what's the impetus to do it so that's just, that's me being honest. <laughs> I just don't know. <laughs> I don't think you're alone in that assessment because there's really often, uh, many times, no good reason, right? It's it's uh, it's just meant to be complicated because people think that's what people want. Yeah, I think you're right. And then on. Uh, this uh, is an interesting question about deep energy retrofits. Hey, podcast team, I've heard some controversy amongst the energy wonks recently on the subject of deep energy retrofits. Some say they have long paybacks and question if the embodied carbon makes them worth the effort and environmental impact. Others say that climate change from greenhouse gases mean that we must do whatever possible to improve our built environment and the performance of our housing stock as soon as we can. What do you all think? Uh, Ian, do you want to go first on this? I think it's a great question. I think it's challenging on the cost perspective uh, for people who maybe are on the fringe of really being able to afford the house in the first place and they may have the best of intentions of wanting to electrify or uh, do a, a, a shallow energy retrofit as Dan Colbert would call it on a house uh, but oftentimes the the money just isn't there uh, they're they're very labor intensive very product intensive and then the uh, the carbon end of it is a, a whole nother layer of accounting that not everybody gets into Matt, I, I think it's great that you led with the cost question because that is so fundamental. Because the way I see it is, you got a project. There's scope, schedule, and budget, and you well, part of you know part of deep energy retrofit is scope. How much are you going to take on? What and then that's going to relate to budget. What's affordable? I think me personally, um, deep energy retrofits. First and foremost, you got to use the right materials because that carbon question it really comes to the front, and that's. That's one of the things I think in my own practice why we started to look at the alternatives getting into wood fiber insulations because that comes carbon negative. It's a carbon storing material. So the idea of a deep energy retrofit, what I do like about it is it's going to be a heck of a lot less carbon than building a new building, like tearing it down and building new. So you're starting in a good location in terms of carbon, but it really comes down to the materials that you're using to do that retrofit. And if they're carbon storing materials, then I think you largely negate the, the sort of level of insulation question, because you're actually doing good with those insulation products, both on future energy savings, but today's embodied carbon question when you install them. So that that's good. 
For me, though, like from my practice, we've always looked at energy models. We really like to look at data. And I think- Can I interrupt you one second, please? Which of the modeling programs do you think is most useful for most people? You're not going to like my answer because we have an in-house model that we just Uh developed. I'm so sorry. Um, And the reason we did that is- to your question, like which one to use, which like the question is what answer are they trying to give you? They, they kind of have a different approach, each one. And for us, it's just a basic Excel spreadsheet. It's really quite straightforward. You got shell area, you got windows, you got infiltration, and then you have climate data. And that is a pretty straightforward when you're coming to, you know, annual demand on square foot basis. That's a pretty pretty straightforward math. And so for us, what we really want to do is lean into an energy model, which we find based on all the tweaking we've done, kind of feedback loops, we find quite good predictively. Um, and we we want to look at the investment cost and the insulation, the systems, the air sealing, and so forth. We want to look at the long-term energy c- c- performance, what the cost reductions are, what those savings are. They're not always going to be a, in a retrofit, we find not always going to be the tightest relationship. It's not like a slam dunk solar install that you get a five, seven year payback. Sometimes it's 12 years, sometimes 15. But I think our bigger goal is then use this. And with this overarching concept of how do we make an all electric building, you know, zero emissions building, and then how in the future can we make that net zero in terms of on-site production, if at all possible, depending on the site. So for me, it's sort of, I, I go back to what Ian started with. It's sort of like we use that model so we can actually say, if we put this much insulation, it's going to cost this much, and we're going to see this kind of benefit. And at some point, you keep adding insulation, and your benefit falls away. And you really got to know where that line is. And that's why I think that uh, like a planning tool to help you really optimize that financial investment versus the environmental performance cost benefits, net zero, however, whatever your criteria is, but really find that line and stick to it. I started as Passive House guy, 100%. You know, we certified the first Passive House in Maine. It was the 12th in the U.S., super early days. But what I really realized is because of the complexity of the, the work we do and the environment we build in and cost being so important, It's not always passive house that's the appropriate solution. It's finding that right balance of first cost investment and use the right materials to do it so we actually don't make a worse problem by having a high carbon footprint building like the like the person who wrote in, you know, their concern was. Because I agree with that. If we're using the wrong materials, that is that's gonna negate our benefit right off the bat. Uh it seemed like you had something to say, Ian. I'm just glad you got that on tape because that was the best explanation of uh, (laughs) deep energy retrofits and the whole bit that I've ever heard. I I love that you have your own in-house model and you're not hanging your hat on something that someone else made for a totally different purpose. Yeah. Uh, I would Uh, add that a, a good way to start is when you have a house, look at what it needs. Does it need new siding? Does it need new windows? And then think about attacking those small projects what's what's the best window you can put in if the siding's fallen off the house then you start to think about how can we uh, add exterior insulation to it what type of siding do we want to have is the house conducive to these details Uh, the housing stock that we have in madison has a lot of those uh kind of bungalow type dormers on them and they are just really not conducive to adding insulation to the roof Uh, so we we end up with a lot of uh, very challenging designs where people would like to put the insulation on the roof put six eight inches on but you simply can't uh, without spending a lot of money refiguring your dormers and your roof line such a good point you know uh the folks who uh, watch the podcast on YouTube seem to be uh, dissatisfied with our conversations about carbon accounting. Uh, do you get the same pushback from uh, clients, Matt? Uh, or are those folks self-selecting to come to you because they, they want to build a better building? That's a great question. You know, I think on the carbon accounting side, it's a fair criticism in my book because we are accounting for carbon in very different ways across the product range out there. And the math is not consistent. The science behind it isn't consistent. That's not to say that I don't think it's invalid per se. It's 
it still is about carbon and embodied carbon and materials and it has to do with the lifespan and recyclability of materials. All of that is real. But I just think the actual tools we have and the metrics we're using right now is in process. It's evolving. And in my mind, quite honestly, that's okay. Like it's going to take time to figure out this scale of complexity of problem. It's going to take some trials. It's going to take adjustment to the standards. So, I, you know, for me, I say I hear the criticism. I think we're in process with this. The key is to do it in good faith, in my opinion, and continue to try and make strides forward. Because let's be honest, there's no rule book. We're writing it right now. And that's that's the state of the art. And so the way I see that is there's some fundamentals about materials, products, carbon, um, chemicals, and the amount of chemicals in various products and so forth, their performance. Like we really try and keep it on that fundamental level. And I know, for example, with like wood fiber insulation, we're using a waste stream from the lumber industry with very little energy. We're creating an insulating product that inherently stores carbon. If it, if, you know, you can look at the range and, and have a debate about that. You can have a debate about end of life, but it's, a very, it's a natural material, has very low chemical inputs, it's fully recyclable, and it's storing carbon. And for me, we can put the data around it and say this, this, and this, but I really want to, I would try and keep it on an upper level when it comes to those conversations, because we'll, we've run a bunch of LCA models, we use Tally a lot, and you know, the, depending on all these little settings about end of life, you're going to have very different outcomes. So we don't try and, and sort of use that data and say it's is it's more accurate than it actually is. So we try and keep that on an upper level. And I, I think we also try and just stay in the debate, stay in the conversation. And for me, I'm trying to keep it on a positive level. Like, let's just try and get as far as we can with carbon accounting and then share the information and try and move this thing forward. Like, you know, it's not about winning right now. It's about, you know, developing understanding. I am super excited. There's so much more to talk about. I'm left a little speechless, but we are going to talk more about this in the all access after show. Uh, I, I want to hear more about physically what it's like building insulation in, in Maine. Uh, that's, that's fascinating to me. And I'm also angling for a tour of the plant. So that's, I would else. love to have you guys come for a visit. So you know where we are. We'd love to have you. We're very proud of the facility. So yeah, how we make it actually is quite simple. We get uh, wood chips delivered from sawmills primarily. Um, we do get some wood chips delivered from chippers who take low grades slash and pulp for, out of the forests, and then they'll chip it and provide that as feedstock. We call it a clean paper chip, basically. That's what they used to give the paper mills. And so what we'll do is we'll take that chip, we'll convey it into what's what is like the best way to describe it is the biggest Instapot you've ever seen. And we're going <laughs> to we're gonna heat and soften the chip up under pressure and steam, eight bars, uh, which is very high pressure. Um, and that's going to kind of soften the fiber. Uh, we're going to cook it for about four to five minutes and kind of loosen the fibers up. And then what we're going to do is we're going to auger feed it under pressure into a posing plate refiner, a thermal mechanical pulper, as they say. It's basically two plates spinning under high pressure really fast. It's 42 inch um, round discs with all these little knife blades that just take that fi the wood chips and rip it into fiber. You've held wood fiber insulation, so you can kind of see that fiber size. It's like you, it's visible, and and that's something we adjust by the pressure we're putting under there and the width between the refiner plates, which is like a sixteenth of an inch, and that's how we get to that fine fiber. When it comes out of the refiner, it's under high pressure, and we put it what's into a, what's called a blow line. And a blow line is a high pressure line. In that blow line is where we're at. We'll add our additives. For example, in the board, we're going to add the wax emulsion, which is going to allow it under that high pressure in this sort of fast moving line. It's going to allow that wax to coat all the fibers, and that provides provides a water resistant. And the good thing is, all those fibers get coated with it. In the case of the loose fill and the bat, we're going to add the boric acid, about six percent by weight, and that too is going to completely coat all those fibers to provide that consistent. Um, fire protection, also mold and mildew inhibitor. From the blow line, we're going to take that up and put it into what is like an industrial hair dryer. It's basically a tube, which is about a meter 40 in diameter. It's about 60 meters long, and we're putting a ton of warm air, not hot air because we don't want to scorch the fiber, warm air and, and sort of with a big fan pushing it. And they, they call it a flash tube dryer because what happens is when we inject the fiber, 
from the blow line into the end of this great big tube, which is going 60 meters straight, that fiber tumbles and dries out. And in three seconds, it goes from 100% moisture down to anywhere from 11 to 7% moisture. So hence the flash tube dryer. So all this, all of a sudden you get this goopy fiber and it's suddenly kind of dried out. And then what we do there, we're talking some pretty serious volume. We're talking um, the refiners are nine tons of wood per hour. So we're mm-hmm. talking a lot of wood chips. <laughs> we're talking a lot of fiber, we're talking a lot of, lot of volume. And what we'll do is we'll take that, those fibers in the air and we'll take it to essentially the top of a cyclone, which is 170 feet tall. It's a big structure. It's very cool. And it basically is what it is, is a Dyson vacuum. Um, supersized. As a matter of fact, John Dyson, who invent, invented the Dyson vacuum, he was a wood products engineer, and he took actually the cyclone drying technology. It's actually fiber separation from air. He took that, shrank it down, and made it into a vacuum cleaner. So there's precedent for this in the wood products industry because that's how you take all this fiber and separate it from the moist air stream. And then at the bottom of that big cyclone, you get this nice little fluffy pile of nice, warm, beautiful smelling wood fiber. And from there, we either package it in a loose fill or we put it through an oven with the bat or we mix it with a resin and put it into the continuous press for the board. So in a way, very, it's like conceptually simple, but I can assure you the doing of it is not easy. We have an incredibly talented uh, team, um, mechanical, electrical, engineering, to be able to put this large-scale uh, equipment together and make it run. So uh, we, it's super fun to see. So if you're ever up in Maine, come come do visit. We'd love to show you. That's all the inv- invitation I need, man. Uh, I'm on my <laughs> way. <laughs> uh, this uh, comes uh, to the podcast email box, citing a house. I've never heard anyone on the podcast talk about citing a home. Most designers say to try for a south-facing roof for solar panels. But are there other reasons to cite another direction? Uh, are there other considerations in orienting the home? What if you have a great view another way, for example? Uh, Ian, you sent a, a series of photos this morning from your house pointing out there's probably more to it than just face it south, right? Yeah, so uh, when we cited our house, uh, my wife and I stood out in the field where we built it, and uh, we, we both had the same idea of which direction but we were off by a couple of degrees from each other uh, and i think it ended up getting cited the uh degrees that my excavator liked the best because both of us uh think that man it would be great if it was a, a little bit this way and then i think my wife is like no but a little bit more than what you're saying uh so we we actually pointed our house uh to the uh southeast which uh, for us faces the Niagara escarpment part that we can, we can look at. So it's where the, the flatter rolling drumlin land that we live on moves up toward Lake Michigan and becomes the, the Niagara escarpment, which is like a, a limestone and other stone deposit that circles the Great Lakes. Uh, but the photos that I sent were uh, twice a year, the sun lines up at 90 degrees to our house and by just a quirk of how we cited it, it's also at a time where the sun is really low. So as it comes up, it takes a long time to get to height and it just fills uh, both levels of our house uh, that are cited to look that direction with light. And it just uh, gives this really great feel inside the house twice a year. And I, I always love being home at sunrise on those days. Matt, what do you think about this? I'm sure in architecture school, they had very simple rules on what you're supposed to do. Am I right? <laughs> well, I always say, don't put your like picture windows facing your neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think so. Like from my passive house side of me, I want to, I want to get that South light, you know, with larger windows. But as you said, kind of in your intro to this is sort of like sometimes the view is to the north or any other direction and you have these choices to make and the way i actually go about it is i love to get passive solar i love east light like the description you just had sounds amazing ian uh, how how you guys did that what you know what what that means in the spaces so it's really about capturing all those moments my focus though from like as i translate that from an environmental response to physical relationships to site and views is 
what windows are you using and where, you know, that that's the thing. Cause if you're going to do a big wall facing West, because there's an amazing view, you, of course you put the windows facing West, but you just got to make sure that you don't overheat that building. So, you know, thinking about what the SHGC or some sort of shading uh, for those windows is, is critical. It's part of that siting question. And if you're doing North windows, you know, just use a good window because there's going to be more heat loss. There's no offsetting gains, but if that's where the view is like, then enjoy that view. And so that, that for me is, is the thing. It's sort of like you, you got to be realistic and you really got to make the most of the sort of beautiful environmental relationships, site relationships, physical relationships. And then just think about what windows or shading or, you know, performance metrics or characteristics. So the house that you build is then comfortable, you know, that you're not going to have a penalty because you optimize to the West or you optimize to the North. You know, you, you want to make sure that those things stay in balance from a thermal performance standpoint. Jeff, do you have uh, thoughts on the subject of siting homes? Um, I mean, well, obviously it's situational, but, um, you know, it's like, I can't remember who said it, but the architecture is sculpting light, you know, it's like, so you gotta, you know, it, it's figuring out where it's coming from and what you want to do with it. It's a complicated subject and I hope you all listening will weigh in on what you think about the sighting of structures, uh, new and, uh, new builds and additions like do you do you make a, a house asymmetrical or uh, off uh, rectilinear uh, perspectives if uh, you have the great view out of a certain elevation and want to take advantage of it it's it's interesting and i'm sure it's more complicated than many folks uh who in the uh high performance world would indicate So, Matt, you're going to stick around for the uh, All Access members after show, and we're going to talk about your uh, serial entrepreneurship, I think is how I would describe <laughs> it. Uh, um, the Timber HP is not your first uh, startup. Am, am I right about that? Yeah. Um, sometimes I think I'm my own worst enemy, but <laughs> <laughs> I get these ideas. Uh, yeah, no, so... I'll give you a little bit of the background and kind of the companies as they unfolded. You know, the, my first company that I started was a design build company and it was with a, a gentleman named Alan Gibson and it was called geologic up here in Maine. And I had come off, you know, doing 10 years of, you know, I went to school 10 years of sort of high end design. And what I, what I really realized after 10 years of practice was a, I want to be more involved with construction because that's actually how stuff happens you know, innovation ideas happen in construction. Drawing boards are great, but that there's not enough engagement with reality on that. So I, I knew I wanted to cross that line and get involved with construction, something I love. Um, and then the second thing was I knew that I wanted to take my design kind of excitement and energy and translate it into something that would be highly beneficial to people and the planet. And just kind of doing a the kind of high end residential just wasn't enough, but, you know, I wanted to be able to translate that, those, that energy more broadly and really sort of have more meaning in the job for me in doing that, you know? And that's why when we fought, launched Geologic and it was 2008, you guys remember what was happening there. It was a disaster uh, for everybody. And so we had a lot of time on our hands as many did. And so we, we really said, okay, we're going to, we're going to build, we're going to finance and build our own prototype. We're going to build it to the passive house standard, which, as you recall, back in 08 was just the wild west of ideas. And so we're going to throw our hat in the ring. As I said, my background, um, I went to a German university. I speak German. So a lot of the early passive house materials were not so easy to decipher. Like the translations, quite honestly, were really bad. But as a German speaker, I was like, oh, I know what they meant. Like they literally just, <laughs> they literally just translated this like, there's been no Englishizing this. This is just like a very one-to-one -one thing. And for an English speaker, it didn't make a lot of sense. But I really engaged with that, the original Passive House stuff. And so we just said, like, we're just going to do this. We're going to we didn't know if it made sense in North America. There wasn't enough precedent. But we're like, you know, it's a well-founded physics experiment. So let's just see what happens when we do that. So we built self-financed and built our first project, which was the Go Home, a little 1,500-square-foot house. And certified as a passive house in Maine, the first one in 12th in the U.S., as I said. It was also, a, you know, USGBC platinum and net zero. And, like, we just threw everything on it we could. 
as a kind of a learning and demonstration. But what we realized with that was with Passive House, there was an opportunity uh, in cold climates like Maine. And it, and the other the other context that, you know, when I'm thinking of 2008 in Maine is we had oil at 110 a barrel and primarily we're doing our space heating in Maine with oil. People were, well, they were literally freezing in their homes. Like we, we needed to think differently about how we're building. So, you know, it was kind of an environmental thing. It was also kind of a social financial thing. But what we, what we really realized with our first passive houses is this opportunity for scale and sustainability, which kind of informed how I think about the other businesses I've done is if you want to do something sustainable, it can't be at a high cost premium to standard construction because people do not invest in that. They just don't. And I think all of us in the room have been in this industry. We know they don't. Like there are some who will, right? The, the odd, you know, the odd investor, they'll go for it. But that is not scale. That is niche. That does not move the needle. That does not make change. And for me, it was sort of like, as I said, I'm like, if I'm going to put all, all this effort in my day job, I really want to try and make buildings more sustainable. Like I have a family, I have kids, like we got to get onto this thing and, and do our part and build, you know, architects and builders, we have an outsized impact uh, on the environment. I mean, our day-to-day job is 40% of emissions in the, you know, from the, in the economy on, on an annual basis. Like we're not dentists where, you know, scratching somebody's teeth doesn't have a big environmental impact, but what we do every day is huge. And that's why I was like, it was a wake up call for me, which is a big driver. And so back to the financial things, we realized you invest in the building shell and basically in Maine, you're using three times the amount of insulation to do a passive house, but you can reduce the cost and complexity of the mechanical system. Now I find in residential, that isn't perfect math. We're usually from a first cost basis, about 6% standard construction. Like we get close and, you know, we can kind of mitigate those, uh, those costs, but we're not quite there. Um, but on larger institutional projects that we're doing, actually, we are coming in cost parity, passive house with new construction, just because the floor to shell area dynamic is very different and so forth, and, and the scale of mechanical systems. But <clears throat> the lesson for me was, you know, we really have to be cost competitive to have the scale impact. And that's why when we started to think about the materials we're using to insulate our buildings, because essentially the difference between a passive house or a high performance building and a standard built building is how much insulation you're using. The studs are the same, the siding, sheathing, everything else is the same. And so we really started doing a deep dive on the insulating products. And that's kind of the Timber HP story that I told where Josh and I came together looking at that. But that the, the, re- the reason we ended up doing Timber HP, like from the business standpoint, was we knew that it was cost competitive and it had performance benefits, sustainability benefits. So we we knew it was worth the effort. We knew it was an investable opportunity, as in we could sell it to other people to put their money into it to help us do this. Um, and then it was worth doing because we, I honestly feel that we can really improve buildings with these new technologies if they're at scale. Like, But it has to be at scale. Niche things don't help. I mean, it's good. Everyone should do what they can, but we really have to think about how we implement at larger scale. And that was the driver for Timber HP. There's two other companies. There's Opal Architecture, which was the architecture side of Geologic. And now we also have a prefab CLT company, which is using the wood fiber insulation from Timber HP with pre-cut CLT. I kind of think of it as a love child, <laughs> like the architecture side and the, and, the, and, the, and the wood fiber insulation side. You put the two together and you have kind of a, a next generation prefab company. But um, yeah, those are the those are the companies uh, that I have that I'm working on these days. We're going to talk more about that in the podcast after show. And if that isn't the best teaser, I can't imagine what's going to get you to tune in. <laughs> uh, there's so much to talk about. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks to Matt, Ian, and Jeff for joining me. And thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay tuned for the after show, folks. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs>